Hi, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining us again or for the very first time. My name is Gal Potashnik, and I'm the Outreach and Member Services Director here at ACT. I want to start by thanking our presenter, Dr. Tommy Stoughton, for making time to share his passion and expertise with us. The main objective of Dr. Stoughton's research efforts is to provide useful information to land managers and practitioners of biology so they can, in turn, make informed decisions regarding conservation of biological diversity, which makes him a perfect fit to talk to a group of folks interested in land conservation, like us. He's also the head of Mad Professor Mushrooms, where he forages for wild mushrooms as well as leads tours in the Plymouth area. We could not be more excited to have him present to us tonight. Presentations like this one, a bit outside our usual realm, and 60 strong in registrants make us especially grateful to be able to bring diverse topics to you when we can't come together in big groups. We can't wait to see what questions might come up from the audience tonight. Before we get there, I want to welcome our new interim director, Rosalind Page. She is a great addition to the ACT family, and we are thrilled to have her back on our team. I also need to thank our members and supporters who make it possible for us to continue to serve our communities and find new ways to do so in the current ever-changing state of our world. If you aren't already a member and feel you can make a donation at this time, please do so. We know you see the importance of the work we do and ask that you support it however possible. Finally, before we get things started, I do have a few housekeeping items to go over. Please bear with me as this one is a bit of a mouthful. Both myself and Sheila Higginson, Act Office Manager, are your moderators for tonight. In the interest of keeping things running smoothly and with minimal confusion, everyone will remain muted with videos off for the presentation portion, which has been pre-recorded and has a runtime of about 30 minutes. Any questions you have during the presentation, please send in the chat window to everyone, and Tommy, our presenter, will answer in real time. For our Q&A portion after the video, anyone comfortable and interested will be able to turn their video on but stay muted unless asking a question. We hope this will give us all a better sense of coming together. If you'd like to ask your question verbally, we'll be using the raise your hand feature found under the participants icon at the bottom of your screen. To find it now, wiggle your mouse and click on the icon labeled participants at the bottom center of your screen. A list of participants will pop up on the right side of the screen and at the bottom of the participants window, you'll find a button labeled raise hand. Click that and your virtual hand is raised. During the Q&A, you'll be able to raise your hand and then be called on, unmuted by a moderator, ask your question and then go back to being muted to keep this moving smoothly. As I mentioned initially, we'll also be able to ask questions at any time using the chat function during and after the presentation, and turning on your video is not required if you aren't comfortable doing so. If you're unsure of how to get to the chat, wiggle your mouse, <laughs> you'll see a chat icon pop up in the bottom right of your screen. Click on that icon for the chat screen to pop up, type your question, and hit send. Do make sure again that you're sending your question to everyone, otherwise we may miss it. Please also be aware that this event is being recorded to go up on our YouTube channel for future viewing. And finally, in an effort to make our events easier to enjoy and accessible to more folks in our community, we have live closed captions available. If you'd like to watch tonight's event with captions, wiggle your mouse, click on the up arrow, Next to the closed captioning button on the bottom right, choose show subtitle from the menu that pops up and you're all set. You can turn the captions off at any time by going back to that menu and choosing hide subtitle. With that, I will pass the mic to Dr. Stoughton for a quick introduction and then we will move into the presentation. Uh, yes, hi. So um, I just wanted to briefly uh, introduce myself and say thanks to everyone for uh, participating in this virtual event. Um, it's unfortunate that we can't come together, but um, perhaps in, in this particular format, uh, you get me um, in a little bit more of a concise format. So I'm not just running on and on about 
fungi, which um, I do, in fact, like to talk about mushrooms, but um, perhaps at some point there's a limit. So um, you'll just have to have me back again sometime. Uh, I am a research faculty at Plymouth State University. Uh, my wife and I uh, have been there since uh, 2016. So um, I'm originally from Southern California, being a transplant in New England. Uh, so I never experienced uh, sub-zero temperatures uh, prior to moving here, which has been really interesting. But uh, as far as mushrooming is concerned, it's um, a surprising amount of overlap between uh, the West and the East, uh, particularly everywhere in sort of the North temperate region, which I talk about a little bit tonight. So um, anyways, I just wanna say uh, thanks everyone for coming and I hope you'll stick around and uh, ask for um, any clarification during the talk as well as uh, questions afterwards. So I think uh, without further ado, we are ready to get started. Welcome everyone to my seminar this evening, highlighting the diversity and distribution of fungi in our local mountains. What is that? My interest in botany and mycology is mostly centered around food, so much of the discussion tonight will focus on edible species and some of their inedible lookalikes. To introduce myself, and to be clear, I have a PhD in botany, not mycology, but I've been picking mushrooms for about more than half of my life at this point, around 18 years. Originally from Southern California, I still consider myself a recent transplant to New England, having moved here in 2016. So many of the species I encounter in the woods are still new to me. That said, the beauty of mushroom hunting in the North Temperate region is that there's a great deal of overlap regarding shared families, and in many cases genera across the Northern Hemisphere. So it's not as if I had to start from scratch when I moved from the desert southwest to the frigid northeast. The species are different, but in many cases in the northeast, there are closely related species that are familiar, that I'm familiar with from out west, with eastern and western North American species together being closely related to similar looking Eurasian species for which many names have been broadly applied in the past. Now, I pre-recorded this presentation, but will be available in the chat while it's playing. So please feel free to interrupt me, or interrupt the video, <clears throat> if you're seeking clarification regarding a statement or are interested in learning more about a particular subject. It can be quite difficult to hold questions until the end, so I encourage you to ask away when something comes up. So, before I get into the thick of things, I need to give you a little bit of a roadmap of where we're going with the seminar. First, I will introduce you to some general information regarding fungi before I highlight just a small handful of groups of macrofungi that I find terribly interesting for a variety of reasons. After that, I will briefly discuss some things that grow around here that look like fungi but aren't. And lastly, how you can get involved in advancing our understanding of diversity and distribution of these organisms locally as well as globally. So we can't have a mushroom talk without a covering some mushroom terminology, right? I assure you, there will not be a test at the end of this talk. You will, however, hear me throw these terms around throughout the talk, so hopefully this is pretty straightforward for most of you. The cap is the top of a mushroom, the gills are underneath, and they hold the structures that release spores in reproduction. Some alternatives to gills not featured in this diagram are pores, which we'll see on boletes later, consisting of tightly packed tiny tubes that look like a sponge layer, and teeth, which look like little stalactites you would see in a cave hanging down from the bottom of the cap. The stem, or stipe, is the stalk of the mushroom. Sometimes a vulva sac and or a skirt or ring may occur, which are evidence of other membranes that used to envelop the mushroom or part of it in early development. Further stipe ornamentations can be relevant to identifications, as we'll see again with the boletes later on. Lastly, the mycelia are the body or bulk of the fungus, which consists usually 
which exists usually in the ground, but may occur in other habitats, including aquatic environments. <clears throat> well, to begin the more interesting introduction, it is important to know that fungi occur in every environment on Earth, and they are the workhorses of nearly every well-studied ecosystem. They are major decomposers, playing a critical role in nutrient cycling, by breaking down complex organic compounds into simpler ones and supplying these to other organisms through a variety of means. Many fungi form natural symbioses including parasitisms, mutualisms, and commensalisms. One such example which is depicted by the cartoon on the right is a mycorrhizal relationship wherein the fungus and the tree form a connection with which they transfer nutrients back and forth to each other's mutual benefit. If you're familiar with mycoheterotrophic plants like Monotropa uniflora, it is this relationship that gets parasitized. Incredibly relevant to our daily lives, fungi are terribly important when it comes to food and drug production as well. In the lower left corner, I'm showing just an example of a piece of profungus, albeit politically incorrect, propaganda from the World War II era highlighting a fungus many of us hardly think about that has been a major player in modern medicine since its accidental discovery in the 1920s, penicillin. Some fungi garnering attention lately, primarily due to elevated environmental conservation concerns, include white nose syndrome, featured in the top left, and chytrid fungus in the top right, both of which have had devastating effects on the organisms they infect and may result in massive and wide, widespread extinctions of many amphibians. I also mentioned food and drug production earlier, and I'm guessing everyone is in, in this virtual room is familiar with the many different kinds of molds associated with food spoilage, which have obvious effects on food production and distribution. I probably should have had a photograph of my kombucha scoby here, which recently died and was molded over, so I could also just make a cool plug for the deliciousness of symbiotic cultures of bacteria and yeast. Kombucha. The point I'm trying to make is that the kingdom fungi is incredibly diverse, and that's not even the half of it. There are numerous colors, shapes, smells, textures that you can see in this set of picture or by taking a stroll through the forest a few days after it rains during the summer and fall months. I'll be highlighting some of these known as macrofungi, but macrofungi represent only a tip of the iceberg when it comes to the magnitude and biodiversity of the kingdom, and I'll be highlighting only a few species of mushrooms within this fairly cohesive group due to time constraints tonight. <clears throat> what I won't be talking about much tonight, but I have to give a shout out now, is another significant portion of the total diversity of kingdom fungi, known as the lichens. Lichens come in many shapes and colors and are composite organisms comprised of algae or cyanobacteria living among the filaments of multiple fungi in a symbiotic relationship. Isn't evolution just insane? Now, some lichens and mushrooms are plant-like, but if there is one thing that you need to take home from tonight's talk, it's this. Fungi are not plants. They are technically more closely related to animals, so I'm sorry to any vegans that cannot cope with this scientific fact. In the lower right, I've made a diagram called a phylogeny which depicts this relationship among the three kingdoms. You can see that fungi and animals share a common ancestor together with plants, but more recently with each other, meaning that over evolutionary time, plants diverged from the lineage that gave rise to both fungi and animals, which are each other's closest relatives. So, with an introduction out of the way, I want to introduce you to just a few recognizable fungi you might just see while out hiking in the summer and fall, even this weekend, starting with the inspiration for this mushroom cartoon 
and the mushroom from the Super, Super Mario Brothers, the genus Amanita. Amanita is a fairly diverse group of species, but many of them are relatively easy to identify with just a little practice. That being said, there are both edible and deadly toxic members of the genus, and it is responsible for something like 90% of fatal mushroom poisonings. Many, though certainly not all myconauts, would argue these mushrooms are better kicked than picked, for lack of a better description. In my opinion, there are several distinctive species which can be safely eaten, and the genus is otherwise chock full of beautiful and interesting diversity. Distinctive features of Amanita include a combination of characters such as pale colored gills, white spore prints, and a well-developed vulva. Many species also have an annulus on the stem and warts on their caps which can be wiped away with your finger under proper conditions. One of the more common, deliciously edible species of Amanita worth getting to know in our area is the Eastern North American Amanita jacksoni. While I don't necessarily recommend this mushroom for beginning foragers, for more mid-level and advanced foragers, this is a perfectly edible mushroom for which it is difficult but not impossible to make a mistake. It is many distinctive features, including its substantial vulva covering the base of the stem as featured in this picture. This is a nice one to eat raw, which is something I don't usually recommend, but there are a few mushrooms for which I make exceptions, and this is one of them. To me, the stems taste a bit different than the cap, being sweeter, and the caps are almost fishy, but in a good way. Moving on from Amanita to some groups that I recommend for beginners, we're going to talk about the artist formerly known as the Canthara Laceae, and that is the Hydnaceae, a fungal family which includes many choice edibles such as golden chanterelles, which probably many of you have heard of, and hedgehog mushrooms. The family is included within the order Cantharalales, along with the Clavarioid fungi in Clavulinaceae, which many of you might know as club or coral fungi. Now, I mentioned golden chanterelles, which were fe featured up close in the previous slide. This is a very, very common summer mushroom, which can be found throughout New Hampshire in a variety of habitats. It has a handful of collectively diagnostic features and is reasonably distinct when it comes to other mushrooms considered by some to be lookalikes. The flavor and aroma are especially distinct as well, and these mushrooms go great with a cream of mushroom soup or any kind of cream sauce, really. With exception for black trumpets, which are a popular and palatable mushroom, the genus Craterellus is perhaps the lesser known cousin of the golden chanterelles. That said, they are excellent chanterelles in their own right, and there are a handful of ed edible species, some of which can be extremely abundant during the season and are also worth getting to know if you're interested in forest to table activities like myself. They have similar gills to that which are found on golden chanterelles, but the key distinction is that they are hollow through the stem. These are probably my favorite chanterelles to eat if I had to pick. The last of the chanterelles I'm going to talk about tonight is the genus Hydnum, or the toothy chanterelles, also known to many foragers as hedgehog mushrooms. These are a group of fungi which are fairly simple to identify to genus and truly choice in terms of flavor as well as texture. Hedgehogs are abundant in fall given appropriate conditions, and are highly resistant to rot like other chanterelles, giving them a fairly long shelf life if refrigerated. In the case of the depressed hedgehog, they often grow in the same habitat and at the same time as craterellus. So if you can learn to identify the habitat, I would say it's worth checking that area around late August or early September, and you might be pleasantly surprised with what you find. Moving on to the last set of fungi I'm going to talk about tonight, 
These are just a couple examples of bolis, which are my specialty and perhaps what got me interested in this mess to begin with. Now, I use the term boli to refer to anything in the order boliteles, which is a broad concept to some, but certainly there are things you'd consider bolites if you are already familiar with them, such as the slippery jacks in genus Swillus, which are technically in a different family, Swillaceae, within the order boliteles, with respect to porcini or the king boli, which many are familiar with. Now, I love bolides for a variety of reasons, including the fact that many are choice edibles and there are no bolides that will cause death, only severe gastrointestinal distress. So, if you make an incorrect identification with a bolide that you plan to eat, it's unlikely to be your last meal, though you may wish you were dead for a brief period after ingesting the mushroom. The other major reason I love bolites is that they are easily recognizable and hyperabundant more or less throughout the entire summer and fall seasons. Very rarely do I go out during the season and not come back with at least a couple different bolites in my basket. I mentioned earlier, but I'm showing here, the distinctive reproductive surface of most but not all bolites, which is a collection of tightly packed tubes that give the appearance of a kitchen sponge. One of the more difficult groups of bolites in our area, which includes some edible species and some with a relatively high percentage of idiosyncratic sickenings, are the birch bolites. Aside from the orange cap species of Lexinum, though, it's a fairly safe genus, which is otherwise very easy to recognize by the presence alone of brown or black scabers. The picture on the top shows clearly the dark scabers of Lexinum versepoli, which gives it the appearance of having a very dirty stipe. These are actually the fibers of the stipe breaking off at their tips and staining dark blackish brown. Below, I'm showing three different Lexinum principally differentiated by their cap color, though the size, distribution, and color of the scabers, along with internal staining reactions and taste, are extremely important for identification of these mushrooms. Most importantly, when identifying Lexinum species, it is imperative to note the host tree, as many of these mycorrhizal species have surprisingly picky palates. <clears throat> Having just demonstrated the distinctive feature of a mostly edible genus, scabers, it is important to then contrast this with an edible lookalike, so I'm featuring the lilac brown boli, Sutorius eximius, here. The key feature of this species, which is not that distantly related to Lexinum, is that these mushrooms have purple scabers, as opposed to the brown or black scabers we see in Lexinum. The scary thing about this mushroom is that it is listed as edible in many of the older books, but it is most certainly toxic to a large percentage of people. Some people are able to eat these, but many are not, and I cannot recommend that you try consuming these otherwise distinctive, common, and quite frankly, substantial bolides. Still, other bolides allied with Lexinum also have scabers, including the genus Heria, which is both edible and palatable. These distinctive treats are easily identified by their pinkish young cap which becomes more brown with age, its chrome yellow stem base, and the pink scabers on the surface of the stem. These are a fascinating species complex in our area, having a global distribution which likely harkens back to the breakup of Pangaea many millions of years ago. They are distributed throughout the eastern part of Northern America, mostly along the Appalachian chain, then they skip across to the Madrian Mountain Archipelago, extending from Arizona through Central America down to Costa Rica, where Heriochromopes occurs with one of its closest relatives, a species with a black cap that is endemic to the volcanoes of Central America. From Central America, Heriochromopes jumps across to southeastern Asia in the Himalayas. It has a close ally in southern Africa that is likely part of the group, 
and among its closest relatives are some chrome yellow truffles in Australia. I desperately wanted to study these fungi for an NSF-funded postdoc, and while my proposal received fairly high marks, it was a bit ambitious to propose that I could travel and sample the distri distribution of this widely ranging and highly variable species group in just a year. I will continue to study it locally, where we likely have two or three species of Haria masquerading under this broadly applied name associated with different mycorrhizal host trees. The boletes that many are familiar with, and perhaps one of the most highly prized mushrooms on earth, along with truffles and morels, is the porcini, or king bolete, which broadly refers to members of the Boletus edulis group. Boletus chippewaensis is our conifer-loving porcini, most abundantly found under hemlock, at least in my immediate area, but found under a diversity of conifers, especially in the fall. This is a large mushroom with a greasy cap and a meaty, swollen stem that is most readily identified by its fine white reticulum, which looks like a cobweb pattern, most notably at the apex of the stipe where it attaches to the cap, as featured in the picture here. The pore surface is initially white with what are called stuffed pores, but as the mushroom matures, the pores become more visible and the pore surface becomes greenish yellow, maturing to olive green. The flesh does not change color when the mushroom is sliced, and its surfaces do not bruise on handling, though the cap of Boletus chippewaensis can be scratched with a fingernail and will stain pinkish almost instantaneously. These boletes are darn right delicious, though they still aren't actually on the top of my list, as far as boletes are concerned. I do, however, chase these around pretty much all summer and fall, as they come out in the droves, usually at least once per year. They can be easily preserved with dehydration, and their flavor improves with time, which is great for winter eats. <clears throat> Again with the lookalikes, I'd be remiss if I didn't highlight a lookalike to the porcini, the bitter bolete. You may notice right away that it has a similar reticulum, but the netting pattern is much more coarse and it is somewhat brownish as opposed to white in the porcini. Furthermore, the pore surface of Tylopilus is pinkish to lilac in color at maturity, which would immediately pull you away from any porcini. If you were still not sure, a simple taste and spit test, which is a method we use for sampling the flavor of a mushroom, without actually ingesting any solids, would quickly tell you that this mushroom is extremely bitter. While it is technically edible, it is by no means palatable. There are several species of Tylopilus which can look strikingly similar, some of which are bitter and some are not, so it will pay to learn how to identify them and or to master the art of the taste and spit so you can sift through the masses that come out in the summertime. For the creative types out there that are into mixology, these mushrooms may also prove useful for spicing up some liquor, liquor to make bitters for fancy drinks and good conversation. <clears throat> Still more edible boletes worth a quick mention, the genus Swillus is a diverse genus associated with conifers and containing a large number of edible species in our area a handful of which are also quite palatable, including the eastern painted swillus, or swillus spragii. This species does not have the characteristic glandular dots and slimy caps that make many swillus recognizable, but this is perhaps what makes it one of the better tasting species in the genus. Generally, while swillus are edible, they will often turn a stir-fry into a slippery mess, and are probably best dehydrated and ground into a spice, which can be used as a thickening agent for cream sauces. Many of them have a great flavor, but the sliminess is difficult to mitigate and may actually cause some gastrointestinal upset if eaten in large quantities. 
Now, I could talk about bow leads all day, so perhaps we can arrange to do this again in the future, where I can do an expose of the order, but due to time constraints, I'll have to leave it there. Suffice to say, this is an incredibly diverse and interesting order comprising many distinctive edible species with a, a wide variety of colors and fascinating ornamentations. I'll be struggling to understand boletes and continuing to hone my skills for many years to come, but I don't think I'll ever stop paying attention to them, nor will I stop making up common names for lesser known boletes, such as Poor Man's Porcini, which is one of my winter staples. In addition to mushrooms, there are many interesting fungi lookalikes in our area, including the slime molds. Now, slime molds are fascinating to me for perhaps three reasons. First of which, they are often colorful and feature fairly intricate designs. In addition, they are neither plant nor fungus, but represent a sort of continuum between the two, as shown in the cartoon diagram in the top left, where they are labeled with the catch-all term protista. The real fascinating thing about slime molds, though, in my opinion, is that they are social amoeba. Basically, they are free-living organisms that go about their daily lives, scanning the forest floor for the next E. coli that they're going to eat, until they undergo a stressor which causes them to chemically signal to each other that it's time to aggregate and form a reproductive structure. The free-living amoebae then come together and cooperate to form a multicellular structure. They go about their reproductive process, and then they disband after all is said and done and go back to being free-living amoebae. Essentially, this is a sort of evolution of multicellularity, and the functioning and breakdown of the aggregation factors, such as this, is at the heart of modern-day cancer research. If you think about it, cancer is really the breakdown of cell-cell cooperation, and probably a breakdown in signaling, which can be observed and studied using these model organisms in the lab. Another fungus look-alike I mentioned already are the mycoheterotrophic plants. I'll say that again and let it set in. These are plants, not fungi. They are special non-green plants which parasitize the mutualism I described earlier called mycorrhizae in which fungi and plants cooperate to each other's mutual benefit. Mycoheterotrophic plants trick fungi into forming a connection and then use that connection to leach photosynthate in the form of carbon from the host tree through the fungal intermediate, therefore lacking requirement to make energy for themselves. Thus, many of the mycoheterotrophs are non-green plants. In closing, I just want to highlight a couple ways that you can get involved with citizen science efforts involving fungi, which is becoming increasingly relevant in a changing global climate. Two relevant platforms you may want to explore are iNaturalist and Mushroom Observer iNaturalist is great because it's useful for organizing your observations of all of life, not just fungi. And there's a companion app called Seek, which is an artificial intelligence used for identification. While Seek may not always give you the right answer when it comes to fungal identification, it can provide you a very useful suggestion in terms of a place to start to compare against what you think it might be. Aside from iNaturalist, Mushroom Observer is another resource that is great for organizing your collection of observations, perusing images for comparisons against close relatives, and observing ranges of variation, and for searching distribution and phenology data. There are tools for creating checklists as well as projects for your area or interests, and it's generally easy to use in terms of its functionality for notifications. Between the two, the more highly qualified and dedicated identifiers are on Mushroom Observer. So if you're seeking information on what you're looking at, this is the place to go, in my opinion. These are great resources for cataloging your own finds, but I encourage you to use them also because you're generating data which can be accessed by researchers like myself. For instance, it would be relatively easy to look at changes in when and where certain mushrooms are found 
and how that corresponds with a client with a changing climate using crowdsourced data as can be found on Mushroom Observer. So I just want to conclude by saying thanks to all of you for, intention, for your attention. And with my remaining time, I'll attempt to answer any questions you might have. Feel absolutely free to reach out to me on Facebook, through email, or on my website. And please do follow me on Instagram at madprofmushies. Thank you. All right. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Tommy, for uh, making that available to us and making sure that uh, the internet connection had nothing to do with our enjoyment this evening. Um, with that, I will invite anybody that is interested in turning on their video um, for the Q&A session um, to go ahead and do so. If you don't feel comfortable, that's totally fine. Um, and also feel free to either chat your questions or raise your hand and we will uh, make it possible for you to ask a question verbally. Looks like, uh, Tommy, if you want to turn your uh, mic back on, we can answer a question from Jane. Uh, do you have a book you suggest for a ranked beginner in mushroom identification? Yeah. Yeah, there are a few books that I recommend. Um, the book that I use for a class that I was teaching um, is sort of a textbook. It's by uh, Arlene and Alan Bessett, and uh, it's called Mushrooms of Northeastern North America. Uh, it's a very good, um, exhaustive list of the species that you would encounter in the Northeast. Um, and it includes all of the edibility information as well as uh, the necessary characters for actually identifying them and not just um, comparing and contrasting pictures, um, which is pretty useful. It's a little bit outdated. Um, it was published, I think, in 94. Uh, so in some cases, there are more species um, than, than we knew at the time. Um, so sometimes when you arrive at a particular species name, um, you might find that you have to then do a little bit more work uh, on the internet to see if we call it um, sort of a new name or if it's been addressed sort of with modern uh, molecular research. Um, so in many cases, some of the older books uh, still have European names. Uh, for North American plants, and it seems that in in more cases than not, uh, there's a European and a North American species that are separate, albeit closely related. Um, so yeah, mushrooms of northeastern North America is a really good one for like all mushrooms, I would say. Um, and then there's a handful of um, edible and or medicinal mushroom books that uh, I would encourage you to maybe check out reviews for um, on the internet. Uh, so let's see. Yeah, if you think of any others, um, might be helpful to send a list and I'll be happy to pass it around when I send the email with the, uh, the recording to yep. everybody that's been registered. That would be really helpful. Yeah, okay, and um, uh, Ashley mentions uh, All That the Rain Promises and More, which is another funny one. Um, it's actually a really good uh, field notebook because it will actually fit in your pocket, um, which is nice. A lot of guides you can't actually take in the field, um, but this is one that you can. It's centered around the West, um, so it's not that useful in the East or in the Northeast. Uh, but it is good for higher level relationships, identifying genera and families. Uh, but then the particular species, you might need to look um, at, a, at a more relevant regional checklist uh, to then compare. Um, Thank you. Okay, um, we've so got a I couple think, more questions that are yeah. coming in here. Um, from David, what activities exist to get involved in person and learn more? Yeah, there are, um, I think in, I'll, I'll just say in normal times, in new normal times, maybe next year, uh, 
There should be more um, forays being organized by uh, some of the different um, mushroom production facilities. So New Hampshire Mushroom Company, um, Dunks Mushrooms down in the south, they do um, some mushroom walks. Uh, I believe there's a mushroom club down in Keene area that also um, normally does forays. Uh, and then Mad Professor's Mushrooms, which is my company, has also done a couple of forays uh, when, when conditions um, permit, which uh, was a little, bit, a little bit weird this year. Um, September didn't really show up the way that it normally does. But, um, but yeah. Uh, I would say if if you are on Facebook, there are some good um, mushroom groups, and usually that's where people advertise um, local forays uh, and community gatherings and things like that. That's a really good tip. I know uh, even for for us, uh, in person events are unfortunately not in the immediate future. So, um, yeah. Let's all hope that things get better soon. <laughs> um, I'm gonna move into our next question here uh, from Turnbull. I find it hard to differentiate between species of hedgehog mushrooms. Any tips? Are there any poisonous ones in the genus around here? Yeah, so uh, genus Hydnum is totally edible. Um, all the species are edible and actually it's, um, sort of impossible to identify the species without doing molecular sequencing at the moment. Um, and so any books that uh, confidently provide an identification are um, a bit wishful in their, in their thinking. Um, but suffice to say, uh, the genus Hydnum is edible. Um, all, the, all the members are palatable. Um, we really have two, um, more common species or members of the group. There's a larger one, Rapandum, which has smaller teeth, and a smaller one, um, uh, Umbilicatum, which is the one that I, I showed, which is usually in wetter, sort of like boggy conditions. Um, and both of them appear sort of uh, towards the fall season. Um, there are some other tooth fungi, including uh, genus Sarcodon, um, which is not that closely related. Uh, and some of them will have a little bit of a bitterness if you do a taste and spit, um, but they're technically edible. They're not toxic. They're just uh, are a few that are not as palatable. All right. Thank you. Um, let's see. And through here, it looks like we have another wisher of uh, group mushroom walks. Um, we'll definitely be putting that on our list of things to do once we do, uh, once we are able to bring people together. I know the mushroom talks have been really, really popular. So we hear you. I promise we will bring something to you as soon as we can bring people together. Um, there's a question here from David Trumper. Uh, why is it that the Caesar mushroom can be eaten raw? Oh yeah, um, actually a, a large number of mushrooms can be eaten raw. Um, I don't usually recommend that people eat mushrooms raw because especially with wild mushrooms, but even with cultivated mushrooms, there are other organisms um, microorganisms that live on those mushrooms. Uh, so depending on uh, your gut microbiome and sort of how much of an iron gut you have, you might consider cooking your food more thoroughly. Um, but it just so happens with this particular one, um, the, I'll say the benefits outweigh the, the cost or the risk, uh, and it, it just tastes really good raw. And there are a few other mushrooms um, that either have a really desirable texture raw that doesn't hold up to cooking or some other reason that you might recommend a raw application. Um, but generally speaking, I recommend people cook their mushrooms, including Caesar's Amanitas. Um, but you might try it. <laughs> yeah. um, as a follow up, David's wondering if it's still good cooked. Yeah, it's definitely still good cooked. 
Okay, great. <laughs> so everybody be safe. I don't want this uh, to be the reason that you have a, a massive tummy ache. <laughs> um, Lynn is wondering if there are any endangered mushrooms in New Hampshire. Ooh, endangered mushrooms. Uh, the, the short answer is no. Um, and that's because uh, in New Hampshire and actually in a lot of states, uh, we know very little about our fungal resources. And so um, there aren't really any of them that are afforded conservation status of any kind. Um, that said, chaga, for example, which is not actually a mushroom, it's a, it's a storage organ um, that has some protections on the White Mountain National Forest because uh, it takes a long time to grow and they're actively trying to understand what constitutes a sustainable harvest of um, the sclerotium that is chaga. Um, but there's one, so like, for example, lion's mane. Um, which many people are probably familiar with. It's a somewhat popular uh, medicinal mushroom and it does grow in the Northeast. Certainly it's in Pennsylvania. It might be in New York. It might be in Connecticut, but there's some question as to whether or not it actually occurs in New Hampshire. Uh, if it does, it's probably near the coast. Um, so that would be one that's rare, maybe if it occurs in the state, um, but it, doesn't have a conservation status, but if it could, if I were in charge, I would say it's endangered in the state if it even grows in our state. Um, but there are a lot of those where we just, um, we know so little about it that uh, if we had um, conservation of mushrooms at this point, uh, there probably would be a large number that are on the list, either um, as a result of pressures from picking, um, or a lack of understanding of distribution and abundance. Okay, um, another just clarifying question here from David, um, and I'm so sorry, um, I'm probably gonna butcher the way that I'm supposed to say this, by, uh, by lion's mane, do you mean the Herithium species? Herithium arenaceus. So um, okay. we have in New Hampshire, Herisium corolloides and Herisium americanum uh, for sure. Uh, but there's some question as to whether or not Herisium arenaceus also occurs in the state. Great, thank you. And thank you for saving me from trying to blunder <laughs> through that. <laughs> um, Barbara has a white bulbous mushroom that doesn't show gills or tubes that grow on the base of white pine. I think she can hold it up. Um, oh. Barbara, where are you? Oh, there you are. Oh, those look um, like puffballs. Oh, there you go. All right. Yeah. Anybody else have mushrooms they want to show off? <laughs> <laughs> this is the time. <laughs> um, awesome. Thank you for the, the quick the quick answer there. Yeah, um, looks like lycoperdon. Does um, that fall in the bully category? Uh, no, they're um, they're technically closely related to the mushrooms that you buy in the store, agarics. They just uh, they don't make gills. They make a spore mass that is inside of the mushroom, um, and eventually they open up a small hole at the top, and they um, you know exude their spores very slowly over time out of that uh, apical pore. Um, that, the common name actually translates to wolf fart, like Operdon. Uh, fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Um, oh my goodness. David is really, is, is really testing me here. Um, I have another question that I'm going to fumble through. Uh, um, oh my goodness. Umbilicatum. Umbilicatum. Yeah, okay, thank you. You see it. Maybe you should read it out yeah, loud. <laughs> umbilicatum teeth seem yellower to me than the rapandum, which seem whiter. Um, I would agree. I think uh, the, the color of the two mushrooms is a little bit different. Um, Hydum rapandum is whiter, and there's a, a small whitish one. Um, I think it's al albidum is the species or something along those lines. But... Uh, but yeah, the the teeth 
are are technically shorter and smaller on the larger mushroom hydnum rapandum, um, which is really to me is more of like a late summer species um, as opposed to early fall or even in late fall now, which is when you find the smaller one, hydnum umbilicatum in and around bogs. Thank you. And thank you for saving me once again. Um, I do have one more question, it looks like, from Marilyn. Uh, do mushrooms come back to the same spot year after year? Some do. So um, there are a lot of different kinds of mushrooms, which I talk a little bit about tonight. So mycorrhizal mushrooms, for example, which actually form an association with a, with a host tree, those stay put because they're connected to the tree and the tree's not going anywhere. So if they come up, they're gonna come up basically in the same spot. Um, there are others that grow on wood um, and those two are less likely to move around. They're sort of on a decaying log and they're not gonna um, necessarily colonize another nearby log. Um, Without, without having exhausted the, the resource that they're on first. So as long as that log still has um, nutrients for the fungus to digest, uh, it will produce year after year on the same log. Um, there are other mushrooms like morels, uh, which are a little bit uh, sort of um, what we call secondary decomposers. So um, those primary decomposers are the ones that will grow directly on wood. And then there are other secondary or tertiary decomposers, which are sort of like downstream. The wood has already been processed, say growing on wood chips, for example, um, as opposed to directly on a log. Uh, and those, those species tend to move around a little bit more. You might find them on this side of a chip pile one week and then on the other side of a chip pile the next week or um, something like that and, and at a landscape level with morels um, moving around depending on um, the conditions that they're responding to probably moisture um, and that's not to say that they're not still in the same general spots it's just that they might not make a mushroom in that exact same spot year after year um, but somewhere nearby um. Yeah, thank you. Uh, looks like Ashley wants uh, next time you're with us to have a challenge round for Mushroom <laughs> ID. So uh, maybe you guys need to start taking pictures and we'll get Tommy in for, <laughs> Absolutely. for more of a lightning round. <laughs> that that um, would be fun. All right, fantastic. Maybe we could do it in person. Let's all keep our fingers hmm. crossed. So, um, Couple more questions here from Turnbull. Is there a field Lovely. guide to bullets you would recommend? Yeah. Um, so I mentioned the uh, mushrooms of northeastern North America by uh, Arlene and Alan Bessett. Uh, they also have a bolete of Eastern North America book, um, and it is amazing. It was published in uh, 2016, I think. Um, so the names are pretty current. Uh, and it even includes some species that had not yet been described, but were known um, in the back. But it's a it's a very, very excellent resource that uses um, very plain language uh, for identifying boletes um, just based on a handful of characters uh, with really excellent descriptive information and comparisons with um, known lookalikes, uh, edibility information, et cetera. So yeah, Bolites of Eastern North America, they're awesome people. I agree with Jessica, definitely. <laughs> and it looks like we've got one more question here, unless somebody thinks of something else while we're talking. Um, what are good species for this time of year? Good species for this time of year. So it will depend a little bit on where in the state you are. Um, usually this time of year, uh, Hen of the Woods is going. 
Um, some people in the state have already seen Hen of the Woods, Grifola, Frondosa around, um, especially in the northern part of the state. Uh, I haven't seen it yet. It might have just been that I missed it, um, but it could still be emerging in certain uh, certain parts of the state just in response to the recent rains. Uh, there's definitely uh, Matsutake, uh, which is a popular mushroom. It is my favorite mushroom um, and my wife's favorite mushroom. Uh, they're out usually through October. Uh, we had a good flush a couple weeks ago that dried out because there was almost no rain at that time. Um, I'm hopeful that there's another flush coming maybe in the next week or so um, in response to rains that we've had over the last several weeks. Um, they're pretty slow to respond, um, but that would be another one that I would expect around this time of year. Um, the waxy caps are definitely coming on, hygrophorus species, uh, which can be a little bit slimy, but have a good texture. Uh, jelly mushrooms are definitely coming out right now. Um, some different witches butter as well as uh, amber jelly roll are out. Uh, let's see, the oyster mushrooms. Um, there is late fall oyster or sarcomixa is out on down beach as well as birch. That's a, also called olive oyster lean. It's a little greenish oyster mushroom. And then uh, the true oysters, genus Pleurotus, are probably emerging uh, now or soon on um, especially sugar maples. So if there's a sugar bush near you, um, those tend to be productive areas for oyster mushrooms, which come out when you really start getting consistent hard frosts at night. Uh, but still temperatures in the 40s or approaching 50s during the daytime. Um, so yeah, still, there's still plenty of mushrooms to be had. Um, there might even be porcini coming out this week. I mean, there there have been some bolites lurking. Uh, it, to me, it seems like it's not warm enough, but um, I'm hopeful that uh, porcini will will maybe make a final appearance perhaps more towards the southern port, port part of the state. Yeah, brick caps, that's another one. Definitely uh, species of hypoloma are out right now. Um, Flemulina of ludipes would be another one that should be coming out if it's not out already um, on elms. They like it when it gets really, really cold. And it looks like Ashley's wondering where you would look for uh, Matsutake. Uh, yeah, the best places for Matsutake are usually um, like fluvial terraces, so like floodplains adjacent uh, older or larger brooks. Um, so not not that dissimilar from from chanterelle habitat that you would find in in similar um, environments, but sort of more upland than that. Um, but really the best habitats are a mix of pine and hemlock um, around the margins of, uh, of ponds and lakes. Um, not Definitely areas that have access to water with a mix of pines and hemlock. Uh, oh, another question coming through from Lynn. Do you recommend any mushroom home kits for eating? Home kits for eating. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot of kits, including some that you can buy like at Walmart that you literally just spray with water. Um, that's a that's a totally reasonable way to grow mushrooms for yourself. And uh, in many cases, once you have that block of mycelium, um, you can then use that to inoculate like a compost pile and and sort of start a strain of oyster mushrooms. Um, so yeah, there. Uh, I think North Spore or Main Cap and Stem maybe is the company that is producing locally, but there are a few I think that you can even get at Walmart that are pretty awesome in my opinion. Uh, awesome. Question about Thank you. how. I think climate change might impact local mushrooms. Yeah. Um, there, 
there is some research that suggests that uh, it will get wetter in the Northeast. Um, and that's like generally speaking. So, you know, that that could mean a variety of different things that it, it depends in part when the water comes and how much water comes at that time, which um, this summer was like really excellent example of like not having any rain for a long time starting to feel like we were in a little bit of a drought and then all of a sudden there was like four inches of rain that comes in three days and we're like back into a hydration mode for a brief time um, but one thing that seems pretty clear at least with plant research is that the 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 summer is longer or the winter is shorter depending on how you're looking at it and so what i think that means for mushrooms is especially for the fall mushrooms I think that September is going to become sort of more of a of a lull and a, a little bit of a slower month. And October will actually be when we get our big fall flush, uh, as you see a sort of pushback of a later and later sort of um, transition towards like leaf peep and and, and all that um, sort of fall flush. Um, it's what I I think. Uh, and that's largely just related to soil temperatures um, not starting to uh, go back down until later in the year. It's interesting to think about um, when we're considering all the other things that are happening around us for climate change, um, where, where this is going to leave us as well with the mushrooms. Um, yeah. I I don't necessarily think we're going to like see a lot of tropical mushrooms move into the Northeast or, or anything like that. But I think um, we will start to notice changes in, in, in when we see mushrooms uh, and, and perhaps changes in abundance, um, but that'll be harder to quantify. I guess it's, uh, it's something to keep an eye out for and, uh, and, if there is citizen science and reporting kind of the, the changes that you see. Um, we do have another question from David here. Is the, oh my goodness, Lotus, I shouldn't be the person reading these. <laughs> or no, or, let's see. Do you see it? <laughs> I, I can't see it. Can you read it? Ah, uh, that's uh, hilarious. Your <laughs> um, Boletus urinensis is a bolete that some people um, have argued looks like a porcini, um, and uh, they they are substantial mushrooms. Um, they're pretty large. They have a similar shape uh, overall to a porcini um, in that they have like a swollen stem base, uh, and they occur in the same habitat with hemlock. Uh, but they don't have any of that reticulum. They don't. Um, they don't have stuffed pores, and they do exhibit uh, bluing, um, staining reactions. So um, it's really not. It's really not something that should be confused for a porcini. Uh, but if you were to eat one, you would get pretty violently ill. Um, you would. Would unlikely you would unlikely to to die from the event, but um, it would be pretty traumatic, vomiting and diarrhea. On that note, <laughs> it looks like we're out of questions. Um, so I am gonna sort of wrap us up here. Um, I want to first really, really. Thank you again. Uh, thank you to both Tommy and to all of our participants. Um, really appreciate everybody pulling together and really coming up. We had so many questions, which is exactly what I was expecting. So thank you all. Um, yeah. It's been really wonderful to uh, to bring you, you all so together. Much. Yeah, absolutely, you. That absolutely. Was really, and I, really helpful. I hope that. Um, Again, this can be the first of many. Um, this is our first time having Tommy with us, so hopefully he's uh, he's totally enthralled with us, and he'll come back again sometime soon. Um, and um, I, we don't have any events planned coming up, but uh, please keep an eye out 
we are going to be working into our event planning for 2021. Uh, and if you have any ideas or want to share anything with us, please do reach out. Um, if you have any questions that come up after today, you can always reach out to me um, or reach Tommy directly, especially for things that um, might have to do with mushrooms. <laughs> um, He's probably your guy. And uh, I think Facebook is probably the easiest way. Uh, Tommy, do you have an email as well that, that you'd like to share? I can yes. put that into uh, the email that we send out. Madprofmushies at gmail.com. That's okay. uh, my business. Um, Great. But it's also Perfect. my pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> so that's in the chat and I will make sure to add that uh, once the video is edited and captioned I'll put it up on YouTube and send out both the resources and uh, the way to contact both of us so if you don't have something to write with um, you will get that in your inboxes thank you guys again so much have a really lovely evening and um, be well take really good care <laughs>